Hello, Davey here, and hello, Skillshare, who's sponsoring this video. So, here's the deal. Before Noctua decided that black was the new brown and released their Chromax lineup of products, there were only the brown versions available. I've got the wrong fan on the wrong cooler tower, but more than a second. But now you can get both versions, so why not review both side by side? Well, that's what we're going to do now. So, if you want an answer to does a painted cooler perform worse than an unpainted cooler, stay tuned since that video is on the way next. So, let's kick off with the unboxing. The only thing that differs between the two of these is pretty much the color of the boxes and the references to Chromax here and there with the black version. Everything else is identical, including the cardboard protective shell around the cooler, which at least doesn't add to the landfill dumps. Let's move on to the towers. If you didn't know, the U in the the name refers to the shape of the heat pipes that travel through the base plate and up the sides of the fin stack. With the standard version you get an unpainted aluminium fin, so fin stack, and nickel plated copper heat pipes, whereas everything on the Chromax version is coated black. The top of the towers present exposed heat pipe tips, although I'll say this is as good as any crimping I've seen on any heat pipe tips. Some coolers have much longer overshoots and crimps, but this is a decent alternative to an aesthetic cap. Working our way down to the base via the central access hole guides us to this steel plate, which can be removed, but you wouldn't really want to since it's required for mounting to all compatible sockets, so it's purely an assembly from the factory type of thing, but maybe worth it's worth checking that it's tight between installs. The base plate itself is comprised of an aluminium top plate with a copper base plate, which sandwiches the heat pipes. This contact area is protected with a plastic cover as opposed to your typical adhesively applied film which can leave some residue. At a glance it looks mirror-like but if you catch the right angle you can make out the grooves in the machining process. It's a shame that you never get to see this again especially on the Chromax version since the transition from black paint to zinc plating is quite satisfying to look at. And yes that was half of an excuse to show you more of the excess footage but only half. How about the fans? Well, there's not really a lot to say. One is beige and brown, and the other is black, and you think you can guess which one comes with its cooler. You can buy more of these off the shelf. They spin up to 2000 RPM, which can be further reduced down to 1550 RPM by the low noise adapter you get with each cooler. Or you could just turn the fan speed down, but at least that gains access accessibility to perhaps lower fan speeds. But I'll say this much. This cooler, this fan now, is spinning at 200 RPM without the no low noise adapter, so I'm, I'm quite confused as to why you'd go for the low noise adapter, maybe just to prevent it from going faster and making more noise. But these are quiet anyway. Anyway, there's more to say in the testing later, so let's press forth with the installation. But before the installation, we need to get the kit in the accessories box. We've got mounting hardware for pretty much any modern and mildly modern socket, NTH1 thermal paste, and an extra set of fan clips in case you wanted a second fan. On that note, I am doing a follow-up uh, video, which will be testing single versus dual fan uh, configurations to see uh, if there's any differences and what they are. You also get a Noctua badge. Uh, personally, I don't care about the badge. It's pretty much junk to me, but I'm surprised they didn't make a black version for the Chromax cooler. Uh, isn't the whole point of the Chromax version to get away from the brown of the normal version? And if you're gonna use the badge, it's just gonna be adding brown to your build. Anyway, that's by the by. The installation manual is clear and easy to follow, and now we're ready for the install. Something I'm appreciating more and more is the one rule for all approach that Noctua has for its cooler mounting solution. Well, not quite one rule for all, there's always an edge case somewhere. The L9i is one of them. If you're not up to speed on the standard Noctua mount, for Intel 1150 series sockets, they provide a back plate with posts, and for AMD, you use the one with your board. There are posts for the Intel 2000 series sockets, if that's your cup of tea. Then you add some spacers and brackets, and then it's time for the cooler. It doesn't get much simpler than that for a mildly big or even a big cooler, and this mounting standard scales up to the largest coolers that Noctua make, so it's familiar territory if you know pretty much anything they make, minus 
the L9i and L9a. And if you don't know it, then it's just a robust mounting solution, tried and tested. Now, something I want to point out about the instruction manual is the thermal paste application guidance. Note, Noctua says, caution, applying too much thermal paste will lower conductivity and cooling performance. I can tell you, and I don't really need to tell you, but with testing that's just out in the world from the infamous gamers Nexus and Linus Tech Tips, I'm sure you know where I'm going with this, that this is complete BS. Less equals bad, enough is good, and too much paste, uh, worst case, equates to just a waste of paste while performing the same as the perfect amount. The pressure of the cooler clamping down on the CPU squeezes any excess paste out of the sides. Uh, just think about how the paste gets from the center to the edges normally. Uh, the paste just isn't strong enough to stop the cooler from pressing down, so uh, the excess is just shifted out of the way until an equilibrium is met. Remember, this is an open system and it isn't sealed or closed around the sides to build any meaningful pressure minus the equilibrium. I'm really not sure why Noctua put this here. Maybe Maybe they just wanted to make sure people don't end up shorting any circuits by adding too much and have it drip into the socket. And if that's a problem, just say so. Don't throw a provably false statement out there or maybe supply some information to back up the claim. So that's to say I've used more paste than I need to to ensure that each test isn't hampered by an attempt to put the perfect amount of paste in only to screw up and not get full coverage. And yes, with some coolers, my attempt to add too much paste has barely covered the IHS fully. With the install out of the way and the coolers up and running, it's time to get down to the data. How do these coolers perform and compare? Now, I've just started on a new testing methodology, so I'm yet to retest a lot of stuff, but it is in the works. So, in addition to the U9Ss, I've retested the Tiny L9i, and I'm going to retest the Scythe Mugen 5, which you'll see in the results, but I'm yet to see myself. I have tested it before. I'm 99% sure, based on the previous testing, that it's going to perform a good chunk better than the U9S is definitely the L9i because I've tested them together before since it's a bigger cooler and isn't that far off in performance to the NHD15S which I again have previously tested Noctua's second biggest retail cooler behind the dual fan version. Starting with the first test setup the acoustically limited setup I set the fan spinning on all coolers to output a total of 36.5 dBA. This shows the differences in thermal performance by sharing an acoustic performance. Using the 3D Mark Firestrike combined looping test which uses an average of 55 watts throughout the test on my test system uh, shows us the unpainted U9S has the edge over the Chromax version and it's not like it's half a degree it's nearly two. Turning up the fire with an average power usage of 100 watts with priority 5 and the gap increases to nearly four degrees which kind of makes sense when comparing to the previous test as nearly half the load results in nearly half the temperature difference. The L9i well that didn't really make it on this one and didn't even make it to 15% through the test on average with each three 10 minute runs, each of the three 10 minute runs. But don't feel sorry for the L9i, feel sorry for the 6700K who had to suffer all the crashes. Anyway, back to the whole acoustically limited thing. To get all of the coolers to match the same noise output for those two tests, there wasn't actually a difference between the two U9S's fans regarding fan speed. Well, nothing significant anyway. At 75% speed, the U9S's 25mm thick 92mm fans were hovering around the 1600 RPM mark. This isn't the same for the L9i where its thinner 14mm thick 92mm fan had to spin at an additional 160 RPM to hit that noise target. So how about we say screw acoustically limited and noise normalized testing and just go ham on the fans to see what we can get out of these coolers. Well if that's the case with the 55 watt fire strike load the gap between the U9S's is a lot smaller only 0.7 degrees Celsius a delta T and as far as I'm concerned, that may as well be about even, considering testing tolerance. And even the L9i is holding on a lot better here. How about the 100 watt Pro 5 load? Well, no surprise, the gap of about 0.7 degrees has increased by roughly double to about 1.8 degrees Celsius. That's a very rough double, but you get the point. The question is, since these aren't noise normalized, how loud are the coolers getting in this full speed configuration? Well, I measured the normal U9S at about 39.5 dBA, around 2035 RPM. And the Chromax version was, well, 
the fans were, you know, you know what I mean. The Chromax version was a touch quieter at 39 dBA, around 200 or 2010 RPM. The difference there will be all down to the manufacturing tolerance in the fans, and you can roll the dice on what you get. Slightly quieter and a touch hotter with the Chromax version, well, with one fan, let's say, or slightly louder and a touch cooler, all in all. And that's why you can't just take these results as the whole picture of whether a painted cooler is better than an unpainted cooler in terms of thermal performance, as the fans need to be the same first. So if you want to know the answer to that and thusly how much an impact the paint is making on the Chromax version of the cooler versus the fan speed, get subscribed to see the results of that experiment soon. If you think about it, and this is going to be kind of self-destructive, the whole plus or minus 10% fan speed tolerance thing you face when getting any cooler or fan of any kind, it kind of kills the absolute true value of the full fan speed testing since you could get an extra degree off by having better luck on the fan speed with your cooler. A very common 1200 RPM fan could come to you as slow as 1080 RPM or as fast as 1320 RPM. This heavily increases the value of noise normalized testing. It means that it doesn't matter how fast or slow the fan can spin as long as they're all creating the same noise level and that normalizes the whole testing procedure. It's, it's all good as long as they're making the same noise. So, which cooler is better value? Well, that would be the NHU9S, at least going by the acoustically limited Firestrike test results and the prices I got from PC Part Picker from the US, UK, and EU. But in all honesty, I'd go with the Chromax version, obviously with the stock fan, not the brand one that I've swapped on here. I'd go with the Chromax version, hands down, since the extra $7 to have the cooler professionally painted uh, for the extra price of a few degrees of thermal performance, you know, at full speed and full load, and that kind of thing at 10% extra cost is, is worth it to me. But if you're a price versus performance purist, the bare brown version is the one you want. Those U9Ss, they sure are good at handling all that power in such a small package. And thanks to Skillshare, so can you. After all, knowledge is power. Let it be known that Skillshare is sponsoring this video. They're an online learning community with thousands of classes for creative and curious people. They cover all sorts of topics like animation, film and video, productivity, marketing, and much, much more. Currently, I've joined the video on a budget class by Christopher Rhodes, the productivity masterclass by Thomas Frank, and the grab your audience class by JR Alley, which is already helping me to discover new techniques for more interesting and engaging introduction shots. That's to name just a few. There are plenty more I've joined up to, to up my video production quality, productivity, lifestyle, and there's even a few on my list to up my Excel skills game to help run the channel and assist in my day job. It's curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads to distract from the main objective, and they're always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused and quickly get stuck into topics with the best first step towards wherever your creativity takes you. If that takes your fancy, it's less than $10 per month with an annual subscription and the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the video description will get a free trial of premium membership. And closing that, I noticed a stark difference in the edge quality with the painted version compared to the, uh, the unpainted version. It really takes the edge off and after holding it for several takes, my hands are cut up. So, closing this one out, a big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, and an even bigger thanks to my Patreons over, or patrons over on Patreon. If you want weekly updates on the progress of the channel and behind the scenes access, and want to help me push forward with making this whole channel bigger and better, please consider heading over there and supporting the channel on Patreon. Otherwise, your subscription, a like, and maybe even a share or comment would mean the world to me. Stay tuned for the painted versus is unpainted and dual versus single fan testing and I'll catch you in the next one.